Welcome and thank you for joining the National Geodetic Survey's monthly webinar series. My name is Steve Vogel and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. I'm a communication specialist at NGS in Silver Spring, Maryland. Today, Philip McFarland from NGS will present global reference frames, what they are and how and why NGS aligns to them. The U.S. National Spatial Reference System is aligned with the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. This presentation discusses what that statement means, why it is done, and how it is achieved. We've given this presentation a technical rating of intermediate, meaning some prior knowledge of the topic is helpful. Philip is a geodesist and reference frame scientist at NGS. He received a bachelor's and a master's degree in geosciences from the University of Arizona. Philip is currently the project manager for NGS contribution to IGS Repro 3, which is a reprocessing of all GPS orbits from 1994 to the present, and is the first step to defining the GNSS contribution to the upcoming ITRF 2020 Global Reference Frame. Thank you, uh, Philip, and you may begin. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and, and thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar today. Okay, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about global reference frames, uh, what they are, and how and why NGS aligns our frames to them, and sort of unpack that and, and explain what all that means. Uh, before we get into the, the nitty gritty, I just want to give you a brief outline of the, the talk today, uh, what we're going to go over. So first, I'm going to tell you about, uh, I'm going to answer the question or try to answer the question, just what is a reference frame in general? And I'm going to give you a very sort of basic example of what that looks like and some of the use cases for that. I'm going to go briefly over uh, traditional geodetic datums and, and how those are slightly different from um, sort of modern global reference frames and actually kind of talk about some of the drawbacks of using um, a, a traditional geodetic datum and why we use global reference frames now. Um, I'm going to give you some kind of technical definitions on global reference frames, uh, talk about the International Terrestrial Reference System, the ITRS, and the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, the ITRF. Um, I'm going to talk about how the ITRF is realized. Um, kind of, we throw that term around a lot in geodesy and sort of being realizing the frame and sort of kind of flesh that out, what that realization means in the terms of the ITRF. Uh, we'll discuss the International GNSS Service, the IGS, and their realization of that frame, the ITRF. And then at the end, I'll talk about how NGS aligns the U.S. National Spatial Reference System, the NSRS, how we align our frames with the ITRF by using the IGS realization of the ITRF. So let's get into it. Oh, uh, before we before we get into the details, I just want to give a quick disclaimer, actually kind of referring back to that poll question. So this presentation, I'm going to cover geometric reference frames. So I'm not going to discuss, I'm not going to explicitly discuss gravity at all in, in this presentation today. Um, we'll talk about gravity implicitly because we'll be talking about satellites and orbits, and of course, gravitation is involved. So it'll be sort of in this implicit way, but we're not going to explicitly talk about um, uh, geo, uh, physical geodetic reference frames. Okay, so what is a reference frame? Well, a reference frame gives us a means to assign self-consistent coordinates to physical locations and describe how those coordinates change over time. So that's sort of a definition that I just came up with um, on my own. Maybe the other definitions might, might differ slightly, but I wanna sort of give you a really basic example in the next few slides to sort of unpack that statement about assigning coordinates in a self-consistent way and tracking how those coordinates of physical locations might change over time. So as my career, uh, as my colleague, Jareer Saleh, told me last week when he and I were discussing this presentation, he said, really, when, when we're talking about a reference frame, we're talking about a set of axes in space. So in three dimensions, we need three axes. So what I'm showing you here is um, a, a triad of axes um, for s in space uh, with the x-axis sort of coming out of the page at you the y-axis going off to the right, and the z-axis, the vertical axis. And the origin of this, this little reference frame that I have here is at the intersection of these axes. And I want to use these, this frame, to start assigning coordinates to physical points in space. But first, before I can do that, I have to come up with a, a 
a unit of length that I'm going to use to describe those coordinates. And once I have that unit of length in mind, I can start to assign coordinates to physical locations, physical points in space. So let's say, for example, I have this point P1, and I want to describe its location in space using this self-consistent frame. Well, I can use that unit of length that I came up with earlier and measure along each axis to come up with coordinates for the point P1 that are self-consistent within this frame. Okay, that's great. How can I use that? Well, let's say we have some other point P2 that we're interested in. And let's say for some reason or another, when we want to assign coordinates to this point P2, for some reason, we're unable to access the origin of the frame. That is, we have no way to sense where the origin is or no way to get at it. But maybe we know where the point P1 is. Maybe someone's published those coordinates already. Well, if that's the case, we can use the known coordinates of P1 and position ourselves relative to P1. And by adding those two vectors together, we can come up with an absolute um, set of coordinates within the frame that's self-consistent, it's consistent with point P1, and it's consistent with the origin of the frame. And I just want to take a second here and point out that this is sort of the general mode of, of business that we that we use here at NGS and for a lot of like the surveying community. So typically what happens is um, a, an official organization, someone like NGS or the IGS or the IERS, they will assign official coordinates to some set of points, points like P1. Um, they'll do the, the dirty work of, of determining where the origin is, defining the frame, and assigning coordinates to some of these points. And then they'll publish those coordinates. And then other folks will come along, people um, like the surveying community or the earth science community, and they'll have some points like P2 that they're interested in positioning to. And they won't be able to get at the origin necessarily, but they'll be able to use the published coordinates of points like P1 to um, come up with coordinates for their points of interest, points like P2, that are self-consistent with the frame that's been defined. And then there's another use case that I wanna talk about really quickly. Let's say we have some third point, point P3. And let's say by some means or another, we've, we've come up with coordinates for the point P3 in this reference frame, absolute coordinates in the, in the frame. Well, it's really handy. The, the reason that we use a reference frame, the reason why we need it um, a lot of times is because it's really simple to come up with a relative position for the point P3 and the point P1 by simply um, taking a subtraction of, of their coordinates in the frame. And furthermore, if those points happen to be moving, so now my point P1 is moving with a velocity V1, my point P3 is moving with a velocity V3, if I can describe the velocities and the initial points in the frame, then I can compute the, the differential vector between the two points at any time t, if I have a description of how things are moving in the frame in a self-consistent manner. And this is sort of more like a, like a navigation type, um, type example where things are moving around, but we have coordinates for things within the frame. They're well-defined. We know the velocities described within the frame, and we want to keep track of where things are with respect to one another. This is another very common use case for reference frames. Okay, so I've given you this really simple example, just these three three axes and just a couple points floating around in space, and maybe they're moving, maybe they're not. But it doesn't take much of an imagination to, to sort of think about how this complexity might grow for these types of systems and things that we might want to keep track of. So I'm showing this, this overhead view of this, this busy harbor here. We have some uh, freight ships and some tugboats. There's an airliner flying overhead. And... Um, you know, in today's world, we need to keep track of where all these things are. And in the case of the harbor, it's it's actually vitally important to our nation's economy to be able to position things accurately, to keep track how they're moving, and to be able to do so in a self-consistent manner using a reference frame. And this idea has applications, you know, as we said, in navigation, earth science, engineering, and of course, in surveying. So I'm gonna keep coming back to this outline as I'm going through the talk, just to kind of um, recap what we've already talked about and keep our eyes on the road and, and talk about where we're going as we move forward. So in the last slides, I just gave you a really basic kind of definition for what a reference frame is and gave you a really simple example of, of what they are and, and, and how they're used. And really the key thing that I want you to take away from those slides is that 
a reference frame is just a way to keep track of um, coordinates of physical points on or near the Earth's surface in space and assign coordinates to points in space and to keep track of how those points are moving um, in time. And uh, in the next section, I'm going to talk about traditional geodetic datums. So I'm just going to give you um, an example of how this is done, or rather how this has been done historically for points on or near the surface of the Earth. So to define a traditional horizontal geodetic datum, so I'm going to talk about horizontal geodetic datums in particular, and I'm not I'm going to leave out vertical uh, geodetic datums um, in this in this discussion, but the a lot of the the things that I'm going to say are they have they're they're similar for the two. Um, for a traditional horizontal geodetic datum, we have to define what we call a reference ellipsoid. And this reference ellipsoid is sort of a, a rough estimate for the shape of the surface of the Earth. It's not an exact um, replica of the shape of the surface of the Earth. It's, it's an estimate. Or it's a, a rough estimate of, of the shape of the Earth. And we use that reference ellipsoid. We reduce our measurements. Um, from the surface of the Earth to that reference ellipsoid to define where coordinates are in space. So what I'm showing in this figure here is, again, this sort of reference ellipsoid here. And then this little patch that I'm showing here is supposed to represent the actual topographic surface of the Earth, so the actual surface. And what we do when we define a horizontal geodetic datum is we just pick some point. Um, it's not exactly arbitrary, but uh, we just pick a point and we say, okay, that's going to be the origin in the datum, and that's going to be our zero point. And we're going to define all of our coordinates for the rest of um, our points of interest within the datum with respect to that origin. So an example of this is the North American datum of 1927, NAD 27. So for that datum, Meads Ranch was selected as the origin. And what I'm showing here is the, the disk and this little tiny point right here in the center of the disk, that's actually the origin, the zero point for um, NAD 27. And so with Meads Ranch as the origin, uh, it was possible to assign coordinates. Again, this is, I'm, this is clearly a simplification. I'm just showing you a little cartoon, trying to explain how this works. So when we define Meads Ranch as the origin, we're able to position other physical points on the surface of the earth with respect to that origin. And when we do that, we are realizing our frame. We're realizing our datum by assigning coordinates to these other five locations with respect to Meads Ranch. And then other folks can come along, say someone up here in Iowa is interested in the location of this point, they can position themselves with respect to this position to this point in Northern Missouri. And if they do so, they will be in a self-consistent manner that puts them into the datum of NAD 27, so long as this point in northern Missouri what is um, measured in a self-consistent way with the datum. And similar with like this point over here, here in Illinois. This person, if they're interested in a point in Illinois, they don't have to measure all the way back to the point in Meads Ranch. They can simply position themselves with respect to this point in northern Missouri. They can add those two vectors together and they can come up with their position in a self-consistent way in central Illinois in NAD 27. And of course, you can co continue to build on that as you move outward. So that's uh, sort of a very, very brief explanation of a traditional horizontal datum. And I quickly wanna talk about some of the drawbacks of using, using that sort of system. The first is really uh, with the definition of that reference ellipsoid. So I'm showing you a little diagram here in the right um, that shows a couple uh, reference ellipsoids. So one for the North American datum, 1927, NAD 27, and one for the European datum of 1950 in red. And as you can see, the North American datum in this cartoon, in this diagram, you can see that the reference ellipsoid aligns really well with the surface of the Earth in some parts of the Earth. But in other parts of the Earth, there's quite a bit of disagreement. And similar for the European datum. In some places, it agrees really well with the surface, of the shape of the surface of the Earth, and other places, it doesn't agree quite so well. And to further complicate things, the center of neither ellipsoid is aligned with the center of mass of the Earth, and the, two, the center of both ellipsoids don't align with each other. So these misalignments can cause complications. So let's say, for example, um, I've measured 
the coordinates of a point using the North American datum. And I have a colleague who's measured the same coordinate using the European datum, and we want to compare notes. Well, this misalignment can cause issues, and it can cause um, discrepancies in coordinates uh, on the order of several, you know, many, many centimeters, significant discrepancies. And so this is a major drawback of using these regional datums. Each datum is optimized, uh, rather each reference ellipsoid is optimized to match the surface of the earth in the region where people are interested in working. So of course the North American datum 1927 is optimized to fit the surface of the earth in North America. Similarly, the European datum 1950 was optimized to, to match the surface of the earth in Europe. But if you want to compare measurements between the two, you can run into some problems. Another major issue with, with this sort of system is that it's static. So when I talked about assigning that coordinate to uh, Meade's Ranch in the center of the United States, in the center of, uh, the, of CONUS, um, that was just literally a, a, a static origin that was set. And then those and positions were measured with respect to that origin in a static way. But we know that the Earth is not static. We know it's a dynamic system. We have tectonic motion, um, glacial isostatic adjustment. We have lots of deformation on the west coast of, of um, North America from the San Andreas system and from subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate. So we know we have all these dynamic processes happening on the Earth. So these static datums, they, they can't account for that in the ways that we need them to any longer. So in the last couple slides, I talked about talked really briefly about um, these, this idea of traditional geodetic datums, some of the shortcomings, and um, I want to move forward now and talk about global reference frames. And I, I really want to talk about some of their strengths and how they sort of um, make up for some of those drawbacks from the traditional style of geodetic datums. Before we get into um, the global reference frames, first I just want to clear up um, a little distinction in terminology. So the first thing um, I want to discuss is a reference system. So I got these definitions from the Springer Handbook of Global Navigation Satellite Systems. Uh, I use them because I think they're really great definitions. They're very technical and we're going to unpack them later in the slides, but I thought I should give these up front. So a reference system is a set of prescriptions and conventions together with the modeling required to define at any time a triad of coordinate axes. And a reference frame realizes the system by means of coordinates of definite points that are accessible directly by occupation or observation. So the reference system is like the, the rules, the models, things that, how are we gonna define this system? That is, that's packed up in the reference system. And we get the reference frame when we start actually assigning coordinates to physical locations on or near the Earth's surface. And my, my advisor in graduate school, Rick Bennett, he used the analogy of the recipe. So the system is like the recipe, it's the ingredients, how we're gonna prepare them, you know, what temperature to set the oven to, all the rules that we're gonna use to create this thing, and the frames like the cake. It's the thing we sort of, it's the product at the end that we're actually gonna sit down and, and eat. Um, I don't recommend trying to eat a reference frame, not a lot of nutritional value there. And in particular, for reference systems and for reference frames, I'm gonna talk about the ITRS, it's the International Terrestrial Reference System, so that's the reference system we're gonna talk about. And the reference frame we're gonna talk about in this presentation is the ITRF, the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. And before I dig in too far, I just want to say quickly that the International Terrestrial Reference System and the International Terrestrial Reference Frame wouldn't be possible without the IERS, the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service. And I've included their URL here. Um, they've got a really great website with lots of information and tons of resources. So if people are really interested in this topic, I suggest checking out their website and, and learning a little bit more. They've got a lot of stuff there. All right, so let's talk about the ITRS, the International Terrestrial Reference System. In order to define the system, we, we basically need three things. We need an origin, so where's the zero point in this reference system gonna be? We need a scale, like what is our measure of length going to be? And we need to define the orientation of the frame. How are the axes going to be oriented in space? Well, for the ITRS, we use Earth's geocenter. So we use the average center of mass of the Earth to define the origin. And it's the total mass that we're talking about here. So the Earth's oceans, the atmospheres, and the solid Earth, the total of all that mass, the average of it, that's what we're gonna use as our origin for the frame. For our scale, we're gonna use the SI unit of length, uh, the, the, the meter, 
And for the orientation, we're going to define it as follows. So we're going to set the x-axis so, so that it extends from the origin to the point on Earth's surface where it pierces, so where it pierces the surface where the equator and the prime meridian intersect. We're going to define the z-axis so it coincides with Earth's average rotation pole. And we'll define the y-axis so that it's orthogonal to the other two axes in a right-handed sense. So that's how we'll define the orientation of, of our axes, of our frame. And one thing I want to quickly point out is that for, for the those definitions that I just laid out, for us to hold those, then our frame actually needs to move with the Earth through space. So obviously the Earth rotates on its axis, so our frame is going to rotate with the Earth as the Earth does so. The Earth is going to rotate about the Sun, uh, rather it's going to orbit the Sun, and our frame is going to move with the Earth as it orbits the Sun. So we call this an Earth-centered, Earth-fixed frame. It moves with the Earth as the Earth moves. All right, and next I want to talk about the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. So as I said earlier, this is the realiz realization of the International Terrestrial Reference System. And, you know, we, like I said, we throw around this term realization, realize the frame a lot. And it's kind of just a fancy way of saying we're going to assign some coordinates to some points on the Earth. So we realize the frame when we follow all those rules. We use that system that's laid out and we assign coordinates to points on or near the Earth's surface in this self-consistent manner. That's what it means to realize the frame. So the frame itself is really, in essence, it's actually those coordinates that we've assigned to those physical points. So in those last couple slides, I just um, sort of introduced some really technical definitions for the International Terrestrial Reference System and gave you, gave you a layout of how that's implemented. And then I talked about the ITRF, the, the realization of the International Terrestrial Reference System. And in the next few slides, I just want to get into sort of a little bit more detail about how the ITRF is realized. And this isn't going to be super heavy on the mathematics or anything like that because, you know, obviously books and papers and everything, you know, tons of stuff has been published on this stuff. But I just want to give a sort of a, a 30,000 foot view of, of what this looks like. So how is the ITRF actually going to be realized? So as I said before, the realization of the ITRF requires assigning self-consistent coordinates to physical points on or near Earth's surface. And the key, the key part to this statement here is that can be occupied or observed directly. So we need to be able to observe or occupy these points. Well, it turns out that a really convenient place to, to start assigning or rather convenient places to start assigning coordinates to physical locations on Earth are places where we have instrument instrumentation set up. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna kind of go through the different techniques, uh, the different instruments that are used to observe these points and to start assigning coordinates to, to these physical points on Earth. Uh, the first technique I wanna tell you about that's used in the realization of the ITRF is very long baseline interferometry, VLBI. So this technique uses radio telescopes to observe quasars, these stellar objects that are hundreds of millions of light years away. So it forms these really long um, sort of observations with these distant objects. And the quasars are observed by radio telescopes in different parts of the world. So I'm, I've got one here in Madagascar. I don't think there's actually a, a, a radio telescope array in Madagascar, but this is just for illustration purposes only. But you can see we can form these really long baselines. We can observe the same quasar in very distant parts of the Earth. So we can get these long baselines, 12,000 kilometer long baselines, observing this very distant object, which gives us resolution on the order of millimeters for these incredibly long baselines. And this is very, very helpful for uh, defining the orientation of Earth, for defining the orientation of the ITRF. And VLBI also contributes to the, the realization of the scale for the ITRF as well. The second technique I want to tell you about is uh, DORIS. It's Doppler Orbitography by Radio Positioning Integrated on Satellite. And really, the way I think about DORIS is sort of like GPS in reverse. So for GPS, obviously, we have the satellites transmitting these radio signals that we receive at stations on the surface of the Earth, and we use that to estimate position. But for Doris, we turn that around. So we have these transmitting beacons on the surface of the Earth. They're sending out radio waves that are being received by these satellites. And then we actually use the Doppler shift 
um, in, in that radio transmission to estimate both the position and the velocity of the satellites. And we can also use that to estimate the position of the transmitting beacon back on Earth. And uh, Doris is used for the realization of the um, orientation and the scale for the ITRF. And the third technique I want to tell you about is satellite laser ranging, SLR. So I, this is kind of one of the techniques that I know the least about, but that I think is really cool. It reminds me, I have like this image of this laser shooting off into space. It looks like Star Wars. Uh, this is like the fun science. It looks like, I think these guys probably have a lot of fun, guys and gals. Um, but the way SLR works is you, it's li you're liter literally shooting a laser from a station down on Earth up to a satellite that's reflecting that laser back down and you're using the two-way travel time of that laser to estimate both the position of the satellite and the position of the ground station on Earth. And um, this technique is very, very important for the realization of the ITRF. It's actually the only technique that contributes to our estimate of the, where the center of mass of Earth is. And the reason um, SLR is able to do that is we know the orbits of these satellites very, very well. And this technique is very, very precise. And as these satellites orbit the Earth, they're actually orbiting the center of mass of the Earth. So they're sensing the center of mass of the Earth directly. And because of the precision of this technique, it allows us to get at where that center of mass actually is. And we're not able to do that using GPS or some of those other techniques for a variety of reasons that I'm, I'm not really gonna go into in this talk, but um, SLR is very, very important for the realization of the ITRF. And the last technique I wanna tell you about that's used in the realization of the ITRF is um, GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems. So GNSS is an umbrella term for these systems. Um, GPS was the first GNSS system, the Global Positioning System. Um, and we used to be the only kids on the block who had this, but other countries and, and other, other folks have joined in the game. So the Europeans now have Galileo, the Russians have GLONASS, um, Japanese have QZSS. So there are many systems similar to GPS now um, orbiting the Earth, and the umbrella term for all of those is, is GNSS. And so for those who aren't familiar, just you know, uh, GPS in two seconds, uh, the way GPS works is we have these, well, in terms of geodesy, the way we use GPS here at NGS or GNSS at NGS is uh, we set up a, a ground tracking station that's fixed to a physical point on Earth. And as these satellites orbit the Earth, they're broadcasting radio signals. And the, the, we have an antenna down here fixed to the surface of the Earth that's attached to a receiver. And that receiver uses those radio signals um, to solve a trilateration problem and estimate both the position of the antenna on the surface of the Earth, as well as the position of the satellites um, you know, orbiting the Earth at 20,000 kilometer elevation. So GPS or GNSS, I, I, I frequently slip into GPS because that's, that's kind of what I came up on, but GNSS um, contributes to the or orientation of the realization of the ITRF. But in my opinion, in my view, GNSS most important job is allowing access to the ITRF. So these GNSS ground stations are much, much cheaper than say a radio telescope, radio telescope array, or an SLR station. They're actually, I mean, they're not cheap, but they're on the, they're much less expensive than those other techniques. And, and so they're much more ubiquitous. They're all over the place. And, and by, they allow access to the ITRF because they're so common and because they're so inexpensive. And also because um, the GPS satellites, the GNSS satellites, they just broadcast their signal and anyone can access that signal. You don't have to have any special stuff other than a GNSS receiver to use it for positioning. So it, it really allows access to the ITRF. And I would argue that's the GNSS's most important role for the realization of the ITRF is actual dissemination. And to sort of drive that point home, I've, I'm showing this screen capture that I took from the IERS website showing their network that was used for the realization of the ITRF 2014. And um, the green dots here are showing locations of um, SLR stations. The black dots are showing Doris stations. The red are showing VLBI. And the blue are showing GNSS stations. And it's pretty easy to see there are way more blue dots than there are of any other color. So a lot more GNSS stations. So maybe they don't give us the center of mass, but they, they're all over the place and they allow us to access the frame. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that in some of these later, later slides, but I just kind of want to show that GNSS is by far the most common type of ground station that we have. <clears throat> 
And before I get into um, how we access the, the ITRF here at NGS, I just want to give a quick shout out to our field crews. Um, you know, as I said in the earlier slides, there's a variety of techniques that go into the realization of the ITRF, VLBI, SLR, DORIS, GNSS, and these are all observing different things. They have different things that they're measuring. And so it's really critical that we have sites where these techniques are co-located, where we have VLBI and SLR in the same place, where we have VLBI and GNSS or DORIS in the same place. And our field crews here at NGS, they actually go out and measure the offsets between the physical points that these, rep that these hold so that we can tie these observations together during the realization of the ITRF, so that when the ITRF is realized, these observations can be tied together. And our NGS field crews are actually really um, internationally recognized at, at the best at, at doing these local ties. So uh, I just want to give them a quick shout. And I'm showing um, Steve Breidenbach, who was my boss for a short time, um, doing some work here in uh, Kauai. Okay, so in those last slides, I talked about the realization um, of the ITRF and, and obviously didn't go into too much detail about the mathematics or anything like that, but just sort of wanted to introduce you to some of the techniques that we use, for, that are used for the realization. And in the next slides, I want to talk about the International GNSS Service, the IGS. Uh, they fall under the umbrella of the IAG, the International Association of Geodesy, and um, the work that they do to realize the ITRF using only GNSS observations and how we use that, their realization of the ITRF to access the ITRF. So the International GNSS Service, their realization of the frame of the ITRF is computed using only data from GNSS tracking stations in, in the IGS network. So they're not using VLBI or SLR or DORIS, they're using only GNSS. But because of the, the way the ITRF is realized with those co-located sites and these observations being tied together, they are able to align their frame, their realization of the ITRF um, to the ITRF so that the origin, orientation, and scale are identical. So it truly is um, a GNSS only realization of that ITRF, of the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. And so I kind of want to give a, a explanation of, of what that looks like. So to do that, I'm going to I'm gonna play make-believe with you here. I've made a little cartoon for you. Um, so I'm just showing on the right, um, uh, Gina says ground tracking station. Like we said earlier, it's fixed to the surface of the earth. It's holding some physical point and it's, it's observing those satellites up in space and it's estimating its, and we're estimating its position. We're estimating coordinates for it, coordinates for it. And then down here, I'm showing a plot and on, on the, the vertical axes, I'm showing position, so dx, dy, dz, and on the horizontal axis, I'm showing time. So we're going from the year 1995 to the year 2020. And all these little dots in the plot represent an estimate of the position of the station for each day. And I want to say here that this is actually, a, uh, we call this a time series. It's a GNSS position time series. And this is actually a synthetic time series. It doesn't represent the position of any, uh, any actual station on Earth. I just made it using sort of fake information for the purposes of illustration for this here. So let's focus on this top plot here, this the X position of the station. So what pops out to me immediately is that this thing is not standing still, right? As we march forward in time, the X position is increasing. The position of the station, the position that this station is holding is changing in time. So if we're trying to define a reference frame using this station, we have a decision to make, right? We have to decide, well, at what time are we gonna assign the coordinate to this station? And so we could call this our reference epoch, our T naught. And we could say, okay, 2010, we can just, we like that, it was a great year. We can, we can select that year as our reference epoch and we can say, okay, great. That's our position for this station. We have an X naught, Y naught, Z naught at the reference epoch, and, and those are the coordinates of this station, and just leave it at that. But it's pretty easy to see that as we get away from the reference epoch, as we keep marching forward in time, our position is gonna diverge from that X naught, right? If we just drew that X naught forward in its flat line going forward, we would slowly diverge from our actual estimates of where that station is. So we can see that this, this sort of assigning coordinates at the reference epoch and calling that good, that's not really gonna work for us anymore. We need to introduce the concept of velocity. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, we're gonna estimate the line 
that goes through these dots the best, we're still going to use a reference epoch. We're going to assign, um, estimate the, the coordinates of the station at the reference epoch P0, but then we're also going to add in this velocity. We're going to add the ability to track the position of that station as we move through time. And I just want to give a shout out to my colleague, Dr. Drew Smith here. Um, I believe he coined the phrase um, coordinate function, and that's exactly what this is. It's a function of time that describe the coordinates of this station as we go forward, as we go through time. And this is literally how the IGS now defines their reference frame. They give us coordinates at the reference epoch along with a velocity that's the best fit to all these dots as we go back and forth through time. So the best red line that fits through here describes the coordinates of the station now. Not, no longer are we talking about just a static fixed set of coordinates. We have to talk about coordinates with velocities. So I just wanted to show this figure really quick. This is a figure from um, Dr. Altamimi's paper, his 2016 paper with colleagues that was in JGR. And this shows the velocity field for all of the ITRF stations um, from, from the realization of the ITRF 2014. And I mean, you just look at it, you see these, these arrows. So the, the blue dots are the, are the reference epic coordinates and the red arrows are the associated velocities. And you just see that, I mean, the static concept of, of a reference frame just isn't gonna cut it anymore. There's so much motion. We have deformation on the West Coast of North America. We have wholesale plate rotation of the North American plate. Things are really moving um, in this frame. And, and so we really need to capture that with, with, um, with again, reference epic coordinates and velocities using those coordinate functions. Okay, so in the last slide, I, I talked about how um, the IGS, the International GNSS Service, uh, realizes the ITRF by estimating positions that are consistent with the ITRF frame and then fitting coordinate functions to those, to those estimates um, as a function of time, and then giving us, disseminating those reference epic coordinates and their velocities. And that is, in a very literal sense, the actual realization of the frame, the coordinates and velocities for those stations um, realize the frame. And then I want to talk about in the next few slides how we at NGS use those coordinates and velocities to align the United States National Reference Spatial Reference System to the ITRF. And we actually use those coordinates and velocities from the IGS to do so. So I want to talk about how we do that. So quickly, um, when we say the NSRS, the National Spatial Reference System, is aligned with the ITRF and IGS frames, what we mean is that stations in the NOAA cores network, the NCN, are aligned with those frames in the computation of our multi-year core solutions, so-called uh, MYCSs. So I just wanted to quickly show you this uh, screen grab I have from our website at, at NGS, showing the, a map of the NOAA cores network. Um, again, it's these GNSS ground tracking stations that are observing satellites. As you can see, there there is just a whole bunch of them on order 2,000, 3,000 at this point, I think. Um, and they're all tracking those satellites. And we here at NGS are tracking their position as a function of time, just like I showed you in those in those previous slides. And we use these stations to align the United States National uh, Spatial Reference System to the ITRF. And in the next few slides, I'm going to explain how we do that using a really simple, well, hope, hopefully simple cartoon that I came up with. Okay, so what I'm showing you here are three axes, two spatial axes. So I've got the x-axis coming out of the page at you and the y-axis, this vertical axis here, and the horizontal axis is meant to represent time. So we're moving forward in time as we go to the right. And I'm going to show you some snapshots in time of this two-dimensional space. So here I've got, again, our reference epoch, T0, and I'm showing you a snapshot of what this two-dimensional space looks like. And in this two-dimensional space, I'm plotting um, the positions of IGS, IGS GNSS tracking stations. So again, this is just a cartoon. We've got a little five-station network. And these are meant to show the reference epoch coordinates of these IGS stations as defined by the IGS in their realization of the frame. But remember I said that the IGS 
doesn't use um, static coordinates anymore, they're giving us velocities now as well. So we have to account for the trajectory of these stations as we go through time. So these dashed lines are meant to show the trajectory of these stations as we march ahead in time. And I'm gonna show you snapshots, at T1, T2, T3. I'm gonna represent this two-dimensional space at these three different times and where these dashed lines pierce these two-dimensional spaces at these snapshots, that shows where the IGS says the station should be at these times. So we have, we've used the reference epic coordinates and the velocities given to us by the IGS to predict where these stations should be at times T1, T2, and T3. And that's what those little black dots represent. So what we do at, IG, at NGS is we actually go ahead and we say, okay, well, we're gonna also estimate the positions of those IGS stations on our own, using our own computers, our own software, our own techniques, and we're gonna estimate the position for those stations. And what we find is our estimates don't quite agree with where the IGS says those stations should be at these snapshots in time. You see there's some misalignment between our estimate and the IGS estimate. Well, that's okay. What we do is we compute um, some transformation parameters, and we're actually able to use those to transform our, our sort of realization of this little network so that it aligns with where the IGS says these stations should be in time. So we've gone ahead and we've estimated these positions and we've used um, transformation parameters to transform our realization and align this little mini network, these little five stations with where the IGS says that they should be. Okay, that's a nice little academic exercise, but where's the actual utility in that? How is that useful? Well, that becomes useful when we hang the NOAA cores network on top of our estimates for where these IGS stations should be. So these green dots are meant to represent the NOAA cores network, That those, those core stations, I showed you that map just a few slides ago. So our network, so we go ahead and estimate at all these times, we estimate the position of the IGS stations, these yellow dots, and at the same time, we estimate positions for stations in the NOAA cores network. And then we go through the same procedure where we compute transformation parameters, we align the IGS network, the IGS stations with where the IGS says they should be at each of these snapshots in time. And we bring the core stations along with it. You see, as I align the two, this are the core stations come along for the ride. And in that way, at these snapshots in time, we actually align our estimates for the positions of the NOAA cores network to be consistent with the IGS frame. So in this way, we are able to realize the ITRF by using the IGS realization and bring the NOAA cores network along for the ride to snap everything into a self-consistent um, frame. And then we take that a little one step further when we do the uh, multi-year core solutions, we say, okay, we now have this self-consistent realization where everything is in this, in this IGS frame at these times, T1, T2, and T3. Now we're gonna estimate velocities for those stations, just like the IGS did. We recognize that these, um, the NOAA cores network stations, are the, their positions are changing as a function of time. And we wanna represent the velocity, the trajectory that best fits those, um, those changing positions. So we do that and we can back project to the exact same reference epoch in this for um, ITR 2014, that would be 2010. And then we come up with rep reference epoch coordinates and velocities for the NOAA cores network in a way that is aligned and consistent with the ITRF and in particular, the IGS realization of the ITRF. And this is actually what we provide to our users. We provide reference epic coordinates and velocities to our users. And then our users can do a very, very similar procedure to what I just laid out, exactly what I just showed, how we align to the IGS. Our users are able to use these reference epic coordinates and velocities to align their measurements, their points of interest to the NSRS. And something very similar to this happens when you submit your GNSS data to OPIS, the Online Positioning User Service. A very similar type procedure happens at your EPIC and points of interest where things are aligned in this way to be um, in the NSRS, to be in uh, the ITRF. And I just quickly wanna show for, for our, our super users out there, for um, people who are very familiar with this stuff, when you actually pull down a position and velocity file for a particular course, so I'm showing a course that's uh, in Illinois, ILSA, when you, when you download one of these files, we actually, that's exactly what we give you here. We give you X, Y, and Z, reference epic coordinates, like these green dots here, and the associated velocities, VX, VY, VZ, these dashed lines. And that's what you're actually pulling down 
um, these coordinates that have been aligned to the ITRF. Okay, so this is my last slide, and, and I just want to say um, that this is ongoing work. Um, you know, as we talked about, the Earth is a dynamic system. Things are moving. And uh, we recently had the multi-year core solution 2 come out, MYCS2, and that was aligned with ITRF 2014, IGS-14. Um, we aligned the National Spatial Reference System, the NOAA Cores Network, uh, with those frames. And that was a huge effort. And again, another shout out to my colleague, Jareer Saleh, who, who really did the heavy lifting on that project and um, got us coordinates for the NOAA Cores Network for the National Spatial Reference System that are consistent and aligned with the ITRF 2014. But like we said, the Earth's not static, it's a dynamic system, things change. So we, since um, the ITRF 2014 was first released, we've had massive earthquakes, um, we've had uh, antennas have changed and, and various things have happened to disrupt the frame so that those velocities that I showed you, those nice neat straight lines that I showed you in those earlier pictures, um, they become less straight and more jagged or they have funky shapes. So um, at, you know, at different times, they actually have to release updates to the ITRF. And so recently one was introduced um, just a few months ago, IGB-14, which accounted for some large earthquakes that had happened, some various other things that had happened. And so we had to go in and, and make some small corrections to, to some of our station coordinates so that we can uh, be consistent with IGB-14, which is another realization of the ITRF 2014. And this work is never gonna stop. It's gonna keep going. The ITRF 2020 is forthcoming. Uh, it'll be released sometime in probably late 2021, maybe early 2022. And we're gonna have to go through this process again at NGS. We're gonna have to come out with multi-year core solution three. We're gonna have to realign to the new ITRF. And we're gonna have to keep doing so every, every so many years to keep ourselves coordinate to, to provide that level of geodetic control to our users that, that they demand um, so we can so we can keep delivering on that promise. If you're interested in learning more about multi-year core solution two, uh, I have a, the URL for, for the website um, that describes that. Um, that was a huge lift for us and a really awesome project and big shout out to my colleagues who, who did all that work. And I'm just gonna leave you with a recap of what I tried to explain today up here and um, turn it back over to Steve and take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Philip. We have a few questions that have come in via the question box. Hopefully not from the experts. Minutes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first question is, why is it important to have the center of the ellipsoid coincide with the Earth's center of mass? Um, well, in the context of a global reference frame, my understanding is that since we are using satellites to sort of define this frame, um, and we know that those satellites orbit the Earth's center of mass, since we wanna use those data to help realize the frame, um, it's very helpful if the uh, if the center of, of of our frame is is coincident co-located with the center of mass of the Earth, uh, it simplifies things. Um, in the term in terms of like that example with the traditional geodetic datums that I that I showed, um, it's it's not necessarily I guess important that the the center of the ellipsoid coincide or be co-located with the center of mass of the Earth. What's what's really important in a global context is consistency, right? That's the whole point of these frames is so that we can assign coordinates in a self-consistent manner and we don't need to sort of jump around from datum to datum to do so. So I guess it's not so much important that they're aligned with the center of mass of the Earth in that context, but it, it is important that those, those reference ellipsoids are aligned with each other so that we can communicate coordinates to our to our colleagues in other in other nations. Um, in a self-consistent way. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Philip. And another question we received is, what are the easiest free tools to convert between coordinate systems? Um, I, I don't, I apologize, I, I do not know. I'm gonna have to, I'll, I'll get back to that, um, that questioner. I don't, I don't know off the top oh, of my head. 
All right. Well, this may be a good uh, time to mention that any questions we receive uh, after the webinar ends, we will uh, send a response by email to, uh, to those participants and to all of our webinar participants. Let me see if we have uh, any other questions we can answer during the presentation. Sorry, Steve. I just sorry. Just back to that that last question. I just want to say quickly, we I we have our own internal set of tools that we use for this work, and I I just have to apologize. I I pretty much rely on those exclusively, so I'm not a good source for for looking outside of our routine work to 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 look at um, free. Uh, programs that, that do those types of conversions. I, we have our own software that does all that stuff. Uh, fair enough. And uh, NGS does have a free tool called NCAT. That's our nickname for it. It stands for NGS Coordinate Transformation and uh, Conversion Tool. And that is a very robust tool that is uh, free to use on our website. Awesome. Uh, let me see if we have any other questions we can queue up now. Uh, here's another similar question. Is there a list of best practices for transformations between different software and hardware throughout a workflow, such as Esri, MicroStation, Trimble? Is that something that you can address, Philip? Uh, again, I, I I feel like I'm I'm falling down on the question and answer portion of the of the webinar here. But again, we have a lot of internal tools, and and I'm really unfamiliar with a lot of those proprietary um, pieces of software like the Esri products and Trimble products and stuff. We um, I didn't come up through a traditional sort of surveying uh, background. Um, I'm more from the earth sciences side of things, and a lot I've used a lot of um, Linux tools and you know local like in-house software for a lot of this work so i i again I, I can't really speak to that too well i apologize uh fair enough we are at the top of our hour so uh it'll be time to wrap up thank you again philip for the excellent presentation and uh, uh before i conclude i'd like to uh, invite you to our next monthly webinar on november 12th when Mike S. Laxon from NGS will present an update on the NGS Coastal Mapping Program. And again, I'll mention that the presentation slides and recorded webinar will be available on our recorded webinar page, webpage, in the next week or so. And we will send a follow-up email with any relevant links and answers to your questions and uh, please take a minute to complete the very brief evaluation that will appear on your computer screen when the webinar ends. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time and we use your comments to improve this webinar series. Thank you again to everyone in our audience for joining our webinar today. We hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks, Steve.